thank you, Design and Daba, for inviting me. Um, my story always starts here in Italy, which is my greatest source of inspiration, both typographic and gastronomic. I never, ever forgave my parents for having the bad judgment to leave and come to America. And the final indignity was that I was born in New Jersey, <laughs> which I had to compensate for by traveling to Italy as often as possible, obsessively photographing signage like you see here in the town of Viareggio, combing flea markets and bookstores, and of course, eating. But because I couldn't live there, I had to learn to make my own typographic oasis in New York. So as art director of Pantheon Books, I had the wonderful opportunity to, to be able to experiment with a different period of design or type history on a daily basis. Um, when I started in publishing, it was kind of a grim time for book jacket design. Everybody seemed to think that they had to follow the same formulas. There was very little innovation going on, and everyone seemed to think that type had to be big and vulgar. I, on the other hand, was on a mission to prove that you didn't have to shout to capture someone's attention, and I think that this cover for The Lover is, is the best example of that. Um, Marguerite Duras, although she was a celebrity in, in France, was relatively unknown in the United States when this book came out. And in spite of that, and in spite of the fact that I designed this very understated jacket, the book became a runaway bestseller, Pantheon's first since Dr. Zhivago in 1958. Um, so I think I proved my point. Um, the other thing that was going on at the time in publishing is that all the art directors were so poorly paid that we all had to freelance for one another. And I got a call one day from a publisher I'd never worked with before who said, we have an Italian Nazi fascist homosexual novel that's just perfect for you. <laughs> so one day it would be fascist type, the next day Wiener Werkstatt. Um, the other thing you have to understand that was going on is that there were really no reference books available on design or type history because Steve, he Steve Heller hadn't written them yet. Um, so I, I had to create my own archive to draw upon. And I, I rejected just traditional um, typefaces for these covers. I wanted them all to be unique. So I would go about making the type in whatever way I could, either Either, either doing it from scratch or piecing together letters from alphabets uh, and from old type books or, or, uh, or altering existing fonts. Um, and keep your eye on this pattern because you're going to see that coming up again later too. Um, I, although I was never a fan of, of reading mysteries, I always had a great deal of fun art directing them at Pantheon. Uh, and this gave me an opportunity to use this futurist letter form from Italy that I had always wanted to, to work with. Um, actually, this, this mystery takes place in South Africa, and I remember I had to send my illustrator, Robert Goldstrom, to the South African Embassy in New York to find out what the, the um, postal uniform looked like, and postage stamp as well. Um, this has got to be an example of the, possibly the worst title in the history of publishing. The thing happens. 20 years later, I still can't tell you what this means. However, it, it was actually a good book. It was a collection of essays by the then film critic of the New Yorker magazine. So I decided to use these little plaster letters that used to be um, used for making your own home movie titles in the 40s and 50s. And you'll see this coming up again later as well. So little by little, I realized that there was life outside of publishing. This was a poster I did for the Society of Publication Designers, which was, of course, done gratis in exchange for creative freedom. And since I had always wanted to design an eye chart, this was a perfect opportunity to do that. Uh, so, uh, 11 years and 2,000 book jackets later seemed as good a time as any to start my own design studio, where I, I quickly learned two lessons of, of having your own studio. One is that you should never depend on any one type of work or any one client. And two, you should never sit around and wait for the phone to ring. I, I'm a firm believer that every designer has to have their own projects in order to, to really find their own personal design voice. So I started with what was closest to my heart, which was, of course, Italian Art Deco. 
And um, this, this turned into a series of um, books on Art Deco graphic design that, that Steve and I did together. Steve and I would collect the, and select the work together. He would do the writing, the, book would be, the books would be designed in my studio where I had two simple rules. We would always design a font based on something that was in the book. And uh, we would always put a woman on the cover, which was, the, which was pretty easy until we got to uh, Germany where they preferred to glorify the Aryan male and not the female, but I did finally manage to exhume this red-headed Fraulein. Uh, so as they, they drifted into remainder purgatory, we, we issued um, uh, Eurodeco, which happily is in hardcover and still in print. And then came uh, many, many others, typology and design connoisseur and, and others. In the meantime, I was discovering that I enjoyed designing interiors of books after having focused for so long just on covers. But the one page that always irked me the most was the copyright page. This is usually one of the first typographic treatments that you see in a book. It's usually on page four, and it's all of this very dreary, dull legal information that has to be set a certain way in, in line for line the way it's given to you from the publisher. Um, so I was determined to, to find a way around that. So I was working on a gardening book one day. We set it in centered lines and I looked at it and I thought, well, with just a few little changes, this could look like a tree. So I tried it out on my son, who was two years old at the time, and he got it. So I figured I was home free. But then I had to lock horns with the copy editor who of course wanted to go by the rules and she just couldn't understand how I could do something so blasphemous. Uh, so after, after much back and forth and after sh supplying um, historical reference, because I certainly wasn't the first designer to ever contour type, I finally won my case. And once I had one under my belt, it was much easier to go on to convince the next publisher. So this was um, poems to Edward Lear this was a book called You Can't Be Too Careful. It's a, an, an Englishman who collected newspaper clippings of strange ways that people have died. Aperitif. This was with Art Spiegelman, uh, Wild Party. A guidebook to the best tea shops in the UK. Lost Words of Love. Writing New York. And I'd always wanted to build the Eiffel Tower out of type. So, uh, this book was a great opportunity. It was the historic shops and restaurants of Paris. Uh, a book of photographs of the Twin Towers. And I think the only reason that I agreed to do this book of photographs of volcanoes was so I could do this copyright page. <laughs> Cuban Deco. And a series of cookbooks, one on chilies and one on beans. And this was a baking book by my client, Sarah Beth. Uh, essays on baseball, and this was an odd one. This was the effects of Nazism on the practice of dermatology, but it made for a good copyright page. So having grown up in an Italian-American household where the main topic of conversation every morning was what to make for dinner, it should have come as no surprise to me that I would end up working in the food industry. So I embraced the very curious world of restaurants where I quickly learned that this is the number one business most likely to fail in New York City. I found myself dealing with a type of client that was about this far from gangsterdom, but on the other hand, I always had a table. So, um, so the first few restaurants I worked on all had unpronounceable French names, were owned by people who were neither French nor that could they even speak French. But uh, for this one, for example, I wanted it to look like a, a classic French uh, enamel sign, and I actually convinced the client to have an enamel sign made for the restaurant. So when the restaurant closed, which is the punchline that you're going to be hearing a lot when I talk about all of these jobs, when the restaurant closed, um, I got to keep the, the uh, sign, which is now in my kitchen. So it was win-win in that sense. So imagine opening a restaurant in the pre-Google era when you have a restaurant name that no one can pronounce, remember, or spell. How do you ever expect anyone to find this place? So Pichelin is a type of olive. I decided to do the logo as sort of a visual mnemonic to, to 
I had to do something to help people remember it. And the, the original logo actually was just the, the type in that olive shape, but then when they got their third star, we added the, the olive branch um, as well. A lot of restaurateurs think that they don't have to spend a lot of time coming up with a name of a restaurant. Uh, they, they just figure that any old name will do and the, the logo designer will make it all work. So um, this was called the Metro Grill because it was in the Hotel Metro, which was pretty uninspired. But um, it was also on a very nondescript block, actually is, this one is still open, um, in New York, which happened to be in the Garment District. So I decided to, to seize on that and made the logo into an actual stitched cl clothing label. Minimum quantity, 5,000. Uh, clients always want to hear that this isn't going to cost you a penny, so I had to figure out other uses for it quickly. So I said, well, let's, let's use this for the menus. We'll just put this into a sleeve with remnants from your upholstery fabric. So they loved that idea um, until we found out that there were no remnants, but um, by then it was too late. <laughs> so. Um, and when these people called me, I was very excited because they said Union Pacific, and I thought, oh, that, that's great. I, I thought about the, the wonderful posters that the railroad did in, uh, in the 20s, but of course it had nothing to do with the Union Pacific Railroad. It was sort of near Union Square, and it was neo-Asian cuisine. So I knew immediately that I had to stack the type uh, in order for... for um, everyone else to avoid having the same misconception that, that I did. And uh, remember that pattern that you saw from the Wiener Werkstatt. Here it is in a completely different context. Um, Metrozor was until recently in the mezzanine of, of Grand Central Terminal right below the, the um, beautiful uh, Zodiac constellation on the ceiling. And it was named after a train line along the French Riviera, so th this was the business card which was letterpressed on both sides. I always tried to use letterpress whenever possible, especially at restaurants, because it gives a, a certain amount of tactility that, that uh, has appetite appeal in my mind. So th this was the easy part, having it letterpressed. The hard part was trying to find someone to put that grommet and string on there. This is another unpronounceable French name from the people who brought you Picheline. Um, a lot of people thought that the way to pronounce it was art is anal. <laughs> so, uh, but this was a French bistro specializing in cheese, so I decided to make it look like a, a cheese label. Um, another default name, this one was called 92. Can anybody guess what street it was on in New York? Um, and it, you know what, it's very hard to do a logo that's just a two-digit number. Um, but as I was riding the subway up to, to see the construction site for the first time, I started really looking carefully at all the subway mosaics, which I've always been very enamored with. And I went back with my camera and photographed every nine and every two, and then had them photoshopped together to, to make this which is sort of an in New York joke, because outside of New York, you, you wouldn't be expected to know that this is a visual metaphor of the New York City subway system. But there are people actually who live in New York who don't even realize that there is no 92nd Street stop. But after working on this for as long as I did, I became convinced that there actually is a 92nd Street stop. And when I um, looked at the Photoshop file and saw that there was a layer in outline like this, I realized that we had our children's menu. So this was given to kids in the restaurant with a red, yellow, and green crayon. And the client was very happy because he said, this will keep them busy for a long, long time. <laughs> Remember that cover with the bad title? Uh, wasn't I happy when I got this call about a, a new restaurant that was going to be a, a restaurant and cinema? So, unfortunately, the, the company that was making those little plaster letters had since gone out of business, so I had to order these in plastic and then spray paint them and sand them so they would be less perfect looking. And, um, and then these photo montages were done. Um, my favorite is the middle menu. Uh, that's the dessert menu, fin. So I mentioned earlier that I obsessively photographed signs in Europe, um, particularly in Italy and, and also in Paris. Uh, and I keep these all organized in binders on a dedicated shelf in my office, all arranged by city, and I refer to them all the time. They're, they're a great inspiration to me. So when a restaurant called Marseille came up, I, I knew that I wanted to make it out of a, um, 
a class, I wanted it to look like a classic neon uh, script like you would see in, in cafes in Paris. So I had a meeting in my office where I gathered the, um, the owner, the sign painter, and the architect, and me, and we all were poring over all of these photographs that I have of, of every neon script from Paris that I've ever photographed just to figure out what kind of neon to use and, and how to make it. So the idea was that um, we would design um, the logo, it, the vector art would be given to the sign maker who would make the sign, and then we would photograph it illuminated, and that would become the logo. But this, of course, is the restaurant business. Nothing ever works the way you expect it to. So um, I ended up having to use the vector art for the menus, but, the, but we we cropped it into different sections for each menu. And ultimately, the, um, the sign was finally made. And the restaurant is still open. So that was a happy story. This is one of my favorite Italian restaurants. It happens to be in Seattle, Washington. And it's owned by a very dear friend of mine. But it, it's, um, you never know what to expect in this place. There's, um, on, any, on any given night, there is a um, tarot card reader a, uh, a cabaret act, and there's even a trapeze in the main dining room. So I wanted to capture that lively atmosphere in the design of this, um, of this business card, which, which was done in letterpress on a very specific shade of pink paper. The client was very particular about that. Um, and I, I put all of these Italian verbs into the pattern. So it's ballare, cantare, divertirsi, festeggiare. So it's like sing, dance, have a good time, etc. Um, and I guess this could be considered to be a default name, but at least it's more elegant than some of the other ones. It is indeed on the corner of Harrison Street. Uh, but as soon as I heard the name of this restaurant, I pictured a, um, a, a, a letterhead for a 40s hotel. I don't know why, so, so that was the inspiration for this. The same owners came to me and they said they wanted to open a uh, restaurant that would feel like a seafood shack that you would just stumble into while you're walking along the beach in New England, except that you're in the East Village of Manhattan. So I decided to break all the rules. I mean, from my book jacket days, I was always adamant about, about never illustrating the title. So there's really no need to say mermaid twice. It's also kind of a, an awkward hyphenation, but I wanted to break all the rules for this because it was such an unusual restaurant. Uh, and when, when they opened their sister restaurant, Mermaid Oyster Bar, we flipped her and put a pearl choker around her neck. And, um, and I also wanted to do something unusual for the Czech presenter, so this, this was my big idea, to use an empty sardine can. The clients were a little bit uh, worried about it because they, they assumed that their customers would cut themselves on the sharp edge and then they would get sued. So I promised them, I gave them my word, that I would personally paint the edges of every can with clear nail polish, which I did. And we delivered them and they were a big hit and they were even written up in the New York Times. And then two weeks later, I got a call from them, they needed 24 more. So this time I had my teenage son do it. Uh, and he's never been able to look at a sardine since. You, do you know what it's like to empty out 24 cans of sardines? It's not anything you want to do. Um, so we delivered those, and they were quiet again for a while, and then two weeks go by, and another request. So this time I went down to investigate, and that's when I learned that there are two different kinds of people in this world, and I am going to prove it to you right now. How many of you, when you go into an elevator and you press the number for your floor, how many of you press it once and only once? Raise your hands. Thank you. How many of you press it more than once? Oh, you're the ones who wrecked my check presenter. <laughs> I didn't, this is something that would never occur to me, but people like you, not that I'll hold it against you, but people like you can't help but play with the pull tab. So that was the end of that good idea. Uh, this is a restaurant and inn that's owned by the actor Richard Gere, and it's, it's uh, north of Manhattan in horse country on the old post road, which is the old mail route from between New York and Boston. And I'd always wanted to design a, a logo to look like a postage stamp. So uh, I discussed that with them. They liked the idea. And I said, well, let's talk about imagery. And Richard Gere 
jumped to his feet and said, oh, I have this great photograph of my grandfather standing in a wheat field. And he, he stood up and he acted it out. You know, he, he said he's standing in the wheat field and he's pushing the wheat back like this. And everyone was transfixed. And um, the next day they, they sent me the, the photo, which was exactly what I was, was expecting. It was a small, blurry, gray snapshot. Uh, but that's why we have illustrators. So I hired Mark Summers, who's a wonderful scratchboard artist, um, to put this together. And then we showed it in a number of different color options, and they liked all the colors. So we ended up using all of them, so hopefully making them collector's items that way. Everybody should have a gelato client. The, my deal with these people is that we have gelato on demand at all times. <laughs> which is a great way to keep clients and my staff happy. Um, and whenever I give a lecture in, in New York City, I always have them cater it, which is a great way to warm up a crowd. I'm sorry I couldn't have it brought here today. Um, but it was great fun, especially to do these little carts that are seen all around the city. When I was doing research in Italy for the Italian Art Deco book, I found myself one afternoon in this, in this stifling, uh, magazzino, a, a storage room that was filled with big boxes of tiny pieces of paper that were printer's proofs. And I stumbled onto this uh, cache of pasticceria papers. The, the, these were used in, in pastry shops to wrap up the pastries. And um, I had never seen anything like this before. And this is really what made me want to become a package designer. So one of my first clients was Bella Cucina, which, is, which are Italian products that are uh, imported by way of Atlanta, Georgia. And then the, this was done for Jean-Georges von Recten. It's a, um, a grapeseed oil, and it's the first time I ever printed on metal, which was scary. And a lot of, a lot of what we do for food packaging are makeovers, because uh, usually clients don't have the, the wherewithal or, or, or money uh, to, uh, to invest in anything when they're first starting their business, but then they reach a point where the, the design of the product doesn't measure up to the, the quality of the product itself. So this was, this was the first redesign we did for Irving Farm, where we designed a bag and then a color-coded system of stickers that gave more information, which was, I think, important for the consumer as well. And then, then that was very successful, but then they decided to, to um, organized their, their coffee into three different categories, so, so the color was added. We've been doing a lot of jam lately. This, is, this was a makeover for Sarah Beth, um, and then this was the first organic cracker. The client was open to the idea of doing a vintage-looking package, so everything on this box was hand-lettered, even the net weight, um, all inspired by uh, turn-of-the-century cracker crates. This is a very interesting lesson in package design. Um, these were the f number one and two best-selling products in all the Williams-Sonoma stores in the US and Canada for nine years straight, the whole time that it was in the store. And what's, what I find really interesting is that this box of salt in the center is seven cents worth of salt that sold for $12. <laughs> what does that tell you about package design? Um, Another jam company that we, we rebranded, and um, this is a completely different kind of a business, though. It's, it, it's a family business in northern Michigan, and it's all about the fruit. Um, you know, they, they have a personal relationship with all of their growers, so if the fruit, if the black raspberry crop isn't good that year, then they just don't make the jam. So I wanted to communicate that human interaction in the logo, so I hired one illustrator to do the logo and yet another illustrator to do the botanicals for the labels. And uh, I thought it was ironic that it took two British illustrators to convey this very American brand. Um, and this is yet another one, Bonnie's Jams, which is also different. This comes out of uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And it's very artisan. It tastes like homemade jams made in small batches. So we created a font uh, based on handwriting samples from the 1940s, because I just wanted it to look like a handwritten label. And Marcus Samuelson is a very well-known chef in New York and is originally from Ethiopia, and this is a new line of teas that we just did for them. It's always good to have something good to drink around the studio. So uh, for this Prosecco label, I wanted the type to literally look effervescent. Um, 
and, and then a lot of these, um, these other labels were, were influenced by poster design in Italy. The, this, this particular type of typography was very common on Italian posters in the early 1900s, as was this. Uh, and in, in France and in Italy in the 1800s, there were, you would often see die-cut leaf shapes uh, as, the, as the wine label, it's something I've always wanted to do, but no one ever has the budget for it. So instead we printed a black background, so hopefully that would just recede into the background. Uh, Trattori is, is made um, the wine from the Salento region of Italy, which is the heel of the boot. And it's best known for Itzuli, which are these little conical-shaped huts, which, is, which became part of the background pattern. And Sfida is a very aptly named wine. It means challenge in Italian, and that's exactly what that was, to fit all of this type into a very specific size and shape. So it all had to be hand-lettered to fit exactly right. And every now and then we do things that are not food-related. Uh, it's not as much fun, I have to say. Uh, but this was for Tiffany. It was a monogram. They, they wanted something that could be used as small as on the winder of a man's watch or as large as a construction shed. And we've done a couple of uh, publishing companies. This is a division of HarperCollins, and this is the publishing arm of Disney. Uh, Ilux is an Italian hosiery importer, and I convinced them that rather than using paper labels like every other sock company does, that they should use these woven labels because I had the supplier from having done Metro Grill, and it worked. And I'm sure a lot of the women in the audience are familiar with Hanky Panky intimately. Um, this is a very high-end dentist on Madison Avenue who gives a complimentary foot massage with every teeth cleaning. <laughs> I never want to get out of that chair. So, um, so I decided that he needed a, a, an equally elegant logo. And I love making logos into objects or making them more dimensional whenever possible. So this is for an SAT test prep service. So the ubiquitous number two pencil was the way to go for that. And uh, Rusk is a very high-end contractor in New York, and I always wanted to do something with one of those wooden and brass folding rulers. Uh, Good Housekeeping came to us uh, uh, just before their 100th anniversary of their Good Housekeeping seal of approval, and they, they wanted an update. And um, I looked at what had come before, and obviously the first logo was the best one, and it was downhill from there, ending with everything we want to forget about design in the 1990s. Uh, so um, I just wanted to design something that would look like it had always been there. So this is what we came up with. And when it was unveiled on the Today Show on television, which I didn't see, but I heard about it, apparently there was a slip up and they showed this is the old one and this is the new one. <laughs> which I took as a compliment because I wanted mine to look timeless, so whatever it takes. Uh, and the little book room does specialized travel guides, which I always enjoy doing the covers for, because I also try to make those look like objects. So this was based on my, my Paris sign reference. This was made to look like, the, uh, like a patisserie box. And uh, this one, Jessica Hish was my senior designer at the time, and we took a trip to the trimmings district of Manhattan, where we bought fluorescent thread sequins and a bedazzler which was a lot of fun. Then the publisher asked me to do this book of, um, uh, of artisan shops in Florence, and, and I said, but I, she wanted me to write it and design it, and I said, well, I am neither a writer nor am I a shopper, and that didn't seem to be a problem for her, so I, it doesn't take much to get me on a plane to Italy to interview shopkeepers and taste test gelato, so um, it was a fun experience. And that led to this one, Italianissimo, which is, the only way I can describe this book is it's everything we love and sometimes love to hate about Italy. Uh, mostly love, from hand gestures to the Fiat Cinquecento, which is almost as cute as, the, as your Mini Cooper. Uh, Rizzoli International, for the 150th birthday of Italy, asked me to design a series of these 10 books that shaped the nation. And this is the latest um, collaboration with Steve on script typefaces. And over the years, I've um, been doing a series of limited edition 
promo books in letterpress called Logos A to Z, because I realized one day that I had done a logo for almost every letter of the alphabet, from O Cafe to Zelda. So these were done in letterpress. Uh, the first book was 26 logos, but I didn't have every letter of the alphabet, so some of them were duplicates. So then I went to a second volume and then a third. By the third, I was unabashedly offering a discount to anyone who had a business that started with a Q, X, or Y. <laughs> so now I actually have every letter of the alphabet, and I have had the files prepared for 100 logos A to Z for a number of years now, but I can't bear to send it to the printer because I'm just waiting for one more perfect logo. Uh, this was for the School of Visual Arts. Every year they ask a different instructor to design the senior library, which is all of the work of the graduating senior design, graphic design majors. And you can do anything you want. So I decided to make it into an, an elaborate box of chocolates. This, however, is the cover of the book. It's not real chocolate, which fooled and disappointed a number of the students. Um, and, uh, and every summer, Steve and I do a master's workshop in Italy. It used to be a week in Venice and a week in Rome, and now it's, it's, it's just in Rome. But I always designed the poster for it. This was um, based on my collection of orange wrappers. Last year was a lot easier because it was just Rome, so I, I got to use the classic Rome street sign for that. And it's, it's very hard to capture someone's attention legally in a New York City subway. Um, this was, a, this was a, a challenging assignment because there have been so many wonderful subway posters that have been designed for the School of Visual Arts. But I was surprised to find out that no one had ever referenced the, um, the subway mosaic since after having done Restaurant 92, I figured it would be a breeze. But it never occurred to me that it would be a lot more work uh, to do 13 words rather than just a two-digit number. So my staff will never forgive me for the tortuous month that they spent photoshopping this tile by tile. Um, but it was really exciting to see it in the subway for two months, and then it came above ground, blown up to 38 feet tall on the side of the school building, where the arrow, the yellow arrow, just happens to point to both the school and my studio. So I get to see it every day on my way to work. Uh, so last year was the year of the biggest thing I ever designed and the smallest thing. This is less than an inch tall, uh, a love stamp for the U.S. Postal Service. And, and uh, also it was done in a, uh, a print run of 250 million, which was by far the, the biggest print run of anything I ever designed. And this is the, um, this was, that, was, that one came out last year for Valentine's Day, and this was this year's. And everything you've seen here and more is in my latest monograph, Elegantissima. And I think the main reason that I did this book was so that I could design this copyright page. <laughs> Thank you.